Matthew chapter 5, uh, this passage is a passage um, that I'm, I enjoy to preach today. Um, again, I didn't give all the stories of what God has done. And I think, you know, if you're visiting here and you're hearing all these, what I'll call, they're spiritual, but they're carnal things. You're hearing about buildings and dirt and facilities, but praise God, there have been souls saved here. Praise God, there have been people baptized. And uh, as I said just a little earlier, there are people that have now graduated to glory. And uh, it just reminds all of us that our time on this earth is a vapor. We've got this opportunity to serve him and may God help us to do it well. But one of the praises that I wanted to share is that uh, I was, and I know this is a carnal thing, um, but I went on deputation uh, when we left Twin Falls Back in 2002, we left in May to begin deputation, and we were going to go on a three-month deputation, and this was our plan, and this is how God gave me freedom from fear. Uh, I remember when I was going out, the number one thing I was concerned about was how was I going to provide for my family, and God just kind of quieted my heart and gave me an assurance, hey, uh, you worked three jobs. Uh, when you got married, you're young enough, you can do it again. I'm not that young now, <laughs> but when we went out, I really believed that when we came here, that's what would happen. I would get three different jobs, do whatever it took. Initially, I thought we would get established after six months, put an ad in the paper and see what happened. That's what I thought was going to happen. And I'm so pleased today to tell you that God is not interested in your plan. Matter of fact, he, he can use your plan to get you going. But God often takes our plan, throws it up, was it up, throws it out, and says, now watch what I'm going to do. And that's what he did. By the way, I didn't tell this, but five years after this church was started, I was, by the grace of God and by the sacrifice of God's people, five years after it began, I was taken on as full-time pastor. In five years. Well, back in the day on deputation, on deputation for three months, um, we raised whatever support we could. I think this is very uncommon back in the day in 2002, uh, but in three months, God gave us $18,000 a month support from churches in three months. And from that, I mean, this is how, this is how young and inexperienced we were. Pastor Chris and I were talking mid-July, about a month before the service began. He's traveling, I'm traveling, and we're different places. And we started thinking about what would the first service be? And I said, well, probably should be announcements, probably should be this, probably should be that. And, and uh, either Pastor Chris or I, one of us said, uh, uh, probably going to be an offering. We've, we've got we've to gotta order offering plates. And I remember saying upon that, when we realized there was going to be an offering, I remember just stopping and saying out loud, what are we going to do with the offering? <laughs> And by the way, these are the very offering plates that we bought back, back in the day. Um, my point is, we, had, we just had so little experience in what, what was to be done, but God made it happen. And this message that I'm preaching today is the message that I shared for three months. This is the message traveling from the East Coast to the West in those three months, all the way from California to South Carolina, uh, North and South. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, and that is the salt and light of the world. Would you read with me out loud verses 13 through 16? 13 through 16, Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. Some of your Bibles are stuck at opening in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Peel it back, go to your left, all right? Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Read out loud with me. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And all God's people said. You see, God has called us with purpose. This message is for those that know Christ as their Savior. And this morning, as you've come to worship him, there's something that God wants you to know where you sit, where you are, and in the busyness of the life that you have. God has not called you simply to save you and bring you to heaven. Has he called you with that purpose in mind? Praise God, yes. But until that time, he's called us to do something now. And my goal is to point everyone to the truth of the doctrine of the word, but no one can live this for you, but you. And at the end of our days, when we stand before God, it isn't going to be Jeff's opinion that really matters in your life. It isn't really even going to be your husband or your wife's opinion that matters at the end of it all. What's going to matter is whether you have lived your life to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What's going to matter is whether you have lived a life that is truly worship-filled and surrendered to the King of Kings. So this service today is meant to invade into your life to a degree that it makes us uncomfortable with purpose, it should. To the degree that it stirs the church from a lethargy, from a laziness, from a distraction, from a complacency, from a do-nothing Christianity to a do-something Christianity, may God use his word. This passage describes Christians in two fashions. It says here, and we'll take time to unpack this for a moment, I will admit that there is some subjectivity into the interpretation of what, is exact, what does it exactly mean to be salt. But this first verse here, the salt of the earth, tells us that God describes us as believers as being this. So we want to take a moment and look at several things that salt represents and that salt does. Uh, some things that you may, may be common to you in your history of, of learning about this passage. And I will say, please give grace to what I'm bringing to you because these are things that as I look at what salt does, these are things that impact my understanding of salt, both in history and in science and in reality. So price is the first thing, price. In other words, salt is valuable. Now, it may not seem valuable to you today, but in early history, Roman soldiers were paid partly in salt. It was a valuable commodity. It wasn't just something that you had on the dinner table at any time you wanted it. It was used for a lot of different purposes. So valuable was it that it was used as a currency of sorts. In Matthew uh, chapter 10, if you'll go to verses 28 through 31... When you think about value, I believe that God calls us salt in part because he has set a value on us. Now, this isn't that passage, but the Bible tells us that believers are redeemed by what? How are we redeemed? What was the price? The precious what? The precious blood of who? His name is Jesus. Jesus so loves the world that he dies on the cross. So that anyone who wants to be saved can be if they will believe in him. His value that he places on the child of God is that he died for you. That he sacrificed himself and he suffered for you to give you a home in heaven. But Matthew chapter 10 uses an illustration of sparrows, verses 28 through 31. It says, and fear not, verse 28, and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Is there a, a proper fear and respect of God? In other words, is it right to understand that I need to be saved because there is a God who will judge my sin, and if I'm outside of his saving grace, there is a hell that is sure. Is it right to come to Christ to be saved for that reason? Amen. Amen. It is. I was told today of a five-year-old in our church that accepted Christ this week. Praise God. A mom got to lead her child to the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
He goes on, he says here in verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more, what? <coughs> ye are of more value than many sparrows. So listen, I, we, we really could sit right here and deal with this doctrinally, emotionally, and psychologically in your life. I think it's worthy of saying at this moment, for those of you that are beating yourself up with your insufficiency, there's time to turn a corner. It's true that our strength is small. It's true that we are not sufficient in ourselves to handle all that life throws at us. But it isn't your sufficiency that God is looking to. It isn't your power that God is looking for you to navigate this world. He has given you himself to help you with the power that he gives. So much so that there, our Bibles are full of all kinds of verses like this. But you know one, Philippians 4.13. What does that verse say in power? It says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So my point is, it's one thing to know that uh, we, we are ineffective. It's another thing to know that we're broken. It's another thing to claim and appropriate God's grace, not live in defeat, and get up and do something for the glory of God. So stop looking at other people being more qualified than you. Stop looking at what other people can do and you can't do. And know that God has placed a value upon you as his child. And that means something. Salt has a price. One commentary has said it this way. Salt is pleasing. How is it pleasing? It improves. Or rather actually brings out the taste of food. So salt is meant as something that is to enhance or make things better. And some of you are using too much of it. But outside of that, it is meant to be something that is good. Have you ever put salt on something and it just really just made it? Okay. Some of you put salt on weird things, right? Some of you put salt on apples. What is that? Some of you put it on watermelon. Now that's blessed of God. Um, <laughs> some of you are like, what? I'm going to try that. Uh, maybe be careful, right? But salt, salt is meant to enhance or bring out the flavor. And there is another verse that tells us as an illustration of salt that we are to not only be salt, but to let our speech be that. It's Colossians chapter four and verse six, and it says this, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And that's a doctrinal study in itself. What does it mean to have speech that is seasoned with salt? Well, let's keep exploring on what salt is. First of all, salt has a price. Secondly, salt is pleasing. It's historically known and accurate and scientifically true that salt was also used as a preservative. We are outside of that scope today. We don't understand history in the same way today where we would salt our meat to preserve, preserve it or salt our food items to give them longevity on the shelf as it were. But that is what salt was used for. So it was a preserving factor. Preserving from what? A preserving from something being, what's the next word? You might know. Spoiled or corrupt, spoiled or going bad. So again, we are used by the Lord as those that help to keep the world from being overrun with the evil that is therein. You want to know whether that's true or not? Uh, all you have to do is look at every media outlet in the world that is trying to shut down anything that mentions Christ. Why? Because the Bible is given as the truth of God's word. And how does the Bible get to man? 
How does the word of God get to others? It gets to others through the salt shaker that you are. Someone was mentioning just today. Have you ever, have you ever uh, seen someone say something on Facebook that needed corrected and you stepped in to do it? Let me ask you, was it well received? Are you still friends? Are you still digital friends? Salt is that preservative. It is that uh, abating the corruption influence of sin and evil in the world. And we are that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you'll go there quickly. 2 Timothy 2 verses 7 and 8. 2 Timothy 2, 7 and 8. We are to speak the truth in grace. We are to let the salt out and give correction where it is needed. <clears throat> when, there is, <clears throat> when there is behavior that doesn't look like Jesus, where there's communication that doesn't look like Jesus, <clears throat> it is right for God's people to come in and with grace, as Colossians 4, 6 says, to come in with grace, and I would add with meekness and with love, but speak the truth. 2 Timothy 2 I hope I've got the right verse. I'm going to have to go there myself. I may be in the wrong verse. It might be Titus. <laughs> My copy notes may have messed up on me. Let's find out. Titus chapter 2. No, it's not Titus. 2 Timothy 2. It's going to be in one of these verses, I, I promise you. Well, it's verses 7 and 8 of a chapter in the Bible. <laughs> you guys get to find it, all right? Do your word search. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. What is it? See, I told you it was Titus. <laughs> there it is. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. So what does he say? That we are in our lives not only a pattern of good works, but we're showing an uncorruptness, a gravity, a sincerity, a sound speech that cannot be condemned as a preserving effect, a stopping corruption in the world, while it isn't our overarching uh, goal in the sense that we're, it is God who is doing his work. God uses his children. And God uses us one amongst another to say and to lead and to disciple and to guide. You know, have you considered this in your life? Have you considered that this thing is maybe not what should be in your life because God says this? So salt is a preservative. Salt is also a purifier. Have you ever heard of Epsom salt? What's it used for? Often it's used for soaking the body or soaking sore joints. Uh, have you ever heard of gargling with salt water to get rid of sores in your mouth or sore throats? Salt acts to dehydrate damaged cells, helping to pull harmful fluids out of a wounded area. So the science behind it is there that salt is a purifier. It is all of those things. And it is one last thing. And I, I lose all the illustration of the peas here. Uh, and that is salt is a catalyst. Salt does something. And I believe this is one of the major points and one of the major reasons that God calls us salt. If you eat, say, Costco pizza, or if you go out to eat at a fast food restaurant, one of those high quality places like McDonald's, any of you ever notice that you get extremely thirsty afterwards? Why is that? Because there's such a strong salt content to the food. So salt makes you thirsty. And I believe this is one of the major doctrines behind salt. And that is you and I are given as salt to the world to make people thirsty for Christ. To help people to understand their need 
for Christ. So you and I aren't going out. And by the way, I really think that we need to think about all these concepts. There, there's a lot of Christianity that gets this wrong. You know, and there's the idea, there's the idea of being salt. Well, I'm going to be salt. And, and you kind of act like that, that uh, prank where somebody at a restaurant unscrews the top of the salt shaker almost all the way off. And you turn it over and the whole thing comes out. Some of us act that way with the salt, but Colossians 4 says season with salt, that it may be, our speech may be with grace, season with salt. In other words, we need to make sure there's love behind the truth that we're speaking. Amen? Amen. But all these things are given that we might understand the illustration that God uses all these illustrations to point to how we are salt to the world. We go on to this next section. You are the light of the world, back in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Then you have this admonition. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works, and I'm going to add, I'm going to explain, not add to, but explain. The good works are a manifestation of how you are living your faith. So it isn't working to get to heaven, but it's living a life that exemplifies to the world around me. This is what a disciple of Christ looks like. This is what a follower of Christ looks like. And by the way, there is an arrogance or pride in that. There is a humility that says, I am following Christ. But there's an ownership that says, my life is to point other people to Jesus. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And here's the phrase at the end. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. It isn't about our good works to earn some kind of favor with God. It's grace that saves every lost soul. Take your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We read there in verse 8 and following what God calls us and how God describes those who were lost but are now saved. Verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. And then he says this, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Do you think the church needs to hear that message today? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Everybody, would you read the last phrase out loud? But rather reprove them. Let's say it again. But rather reprove them. That is salt coming out of the shaker. It is light going into a dark world. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. You are the light of the world. First Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would. We've got one other passage outside of this one. First Thessalonians 5, verses 5 and 6. First Thessalonians 5, verses 5 and 6. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 5. You are the light, excuse me, you are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. What does he call you there? You are a child of what? Take your Bible to one last passage, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. 
regarding this light of the world, you being the light of the world. Philippians chapter 2. And would you read out loud with me verses 14 and 15. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Do you believe that God has called you to be a child, a child of light? So are we. So here is the thing about salt and light. Both are active agents that God is using to describe you. So the application of which is very, is very obvious and very clearly understood. Salt in the shaker does what? Salt in the shaker does what? It does nothing. It does nothing. If you have a light, a flashlight, and you're in the darkness and you don't turn the light on, the flashlight is what? It's worthless. It's of no good. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help anyone. And the Bible is very strong in its language. So go back to Matthew 5 and look at verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth, listen to this, not friendly language, but it's true. It's thenceforth what? Everybody say it. What is it? Good for nothing. God didn't make you a good for nothing. Hello? Amen. He did not make you a good for nothing. You are salt because he made you that. You are light because he is the light of the world and you are his child. But here's the point, folks. This world needs Jesus. This world needs a savior. I was listening, I, I read, I read Jim and Myra Wrights, they're our missionary, they're fur, furlough replacement missionaries. I read their last prayer letter and here's what they said. They're in Canada and they said, it's been a long time. Matter of fact, I think their language was stronger. They said they haven't been in a country that was that hard to the gospel. Let me ask you, what's the state of the United States? How are we? How are we, do, how are we doing in our thirst for God today? So I think what happens is that sometimes we look at the world around us and we think, oh, it's so dark and, and you know, there's, there's no reason to go. And, you know, people aren't going to listen. People don't want to hear what I've got to say. And then you just get your head down and you start living your day-to-day -day life and you lose the focus that God has for you of being salt and light in the world. And what I want to tell you is that God is as powerful as he has ever been. His word is as true as it has ever been. And God is still doing miracles today. God is still saving souls today. God is still rescuing sinners. And you and I have been called to the task of being the flashlight or being the candle that gets turned on. Or being the salt shaker that goes out into the world to tell people about Jesus. We came to this valley back in 2002. Let me just draw back in history. I, I was saved in... Newcastle, Indiana, the Midwest, people often would say. I was born in Mississippi, went back to school, grad school down in the south, went to Bible college in Wisconsin. So I, I lived in what I often call the Bible belt from north to south. And when I surrendered to ministry, one of the things that burdened my heart is I wanted to go to a place where the gospel was not preached on every corner or where there was what I perceived a greater need. Now, this is what I would tell you today. Today, what I'll tell you is that I think the need is everywhere. Amen. Everywhere. 
A person in Wisconsin, a state where it has a Bible college, tells me in their local region, there are 16 churches without pastors. Michael Smith, the missionary that was just here, referenced, was it 25 or 50? I don't remember. What was it? 25 churches without pastors. Monty, you better start taking the total because I don't know what your total is today. Uh, Bruce McAllister often references 60 churches that need pastors. And these are just individual men taking scope of what they know. And here's the point. There are churches that are closing their doors by the droves. And really, there is a lack of servants going into the labor force. And we've got to do something about it. And really, it isn't just being a full-time vocational minister. It's time for Christians to be the salt and the light that God called them to be. We came to this valley. And by the way, if you grow up in Indiana, you don't know where Idaho is if you're in public school. (laughs) This is a mission field. Amen? Amen. Hello, is this a mission field? It's a mission field God has called us to. There is a work to be done here. But it doesn't happen unless you make a decision to be purposeful about being a disciple of Christ under the illustration of salt and light. Now, here's the thing, folks. There used to be a time, and my, my purpose in here is not to argue over methodology. There was a time in history where much of Christianity identified its evangelistic efforts by going what? Door to door. And there are many people that would say today, door to door doesn't work. I don't care. That's not the point. If you want to go door to door, praise God, may God use you. But here's the point, that for many, not having that methodology, the evangelistic or the salt or the light has just been shut. Now, who administrates the gospel in your life? Who administrates the gospel in your life? The answer is the Holy Spirit. You don't need a program to be evangelistic. Amen? Amen. You do not need a program to be evangelistic. You know what you need? The same thing that I need. The rebuke, the conviction, the compulsion of the Holy Spirit to open my mouth and speak Jesus. To pray for a way that God would allow me and help me to be a missionary in a world that needs to know him. This is why we came here. We came out west because we knew there was a strong Mormon influence. We came out west. Do you know the statistics of this valley? How many gospel percentage-wise, how many gospel preaching churches are in this valley? You get a number in your head. Get a number in your head, okay? Okay. In a valley that's about 750,000. And I'm talking every brand and stripe of gospel preaching churches. And what I mean by that, I'm talking about the ones that are rocking out. I'm talking about the ones that are uh, super conservative in that spectrum. If they're preaching a clear gospel message that Jesus is the only way to be saved, what is the percentage of churches in this valley that are preaching the gospel, you got a percentage in your head? Do you know what it is? It is one to three percent in this valley. Do you know what? That story is true all over this nation. Every big city pretty much has the same statistic. One to three percent. Back in the day when we were doing presentation of the gospel here, uh, it's been a while since I've done this, but I still remember from the day when we did it. Do you know how much of this valley goes to church, at least back in 2002, how much of this valley goes to church on a Sunday? I doubt it's the same today. But back in 2002, 48% of this valley went to church on Sunday. A little less than half. Of that half... 24% of that 48 were Mormon. 
That leaves you with 24%. That 24% now includes Catholic, Jehovah Witness, and every other doctrinal variety you've got so that when you look at those who are preaching the gospel, it's 1% to 3%. So when you're in the dark, how much light do you need to be seen? It's not a real trick question. When you're in the dark, how much light do you need to be seen? Very little. Very little. But God has called you to be that. God has called me to be that. If this church isn't going to be about pointing people to Jesus and isn't going to be vocal about pointing people to Jesus, I can guarantee you that we're going to follow the path of Pastor Phil's preaching in Revelation, and this church will have lost its focus, lost its first love, and it will go the way of all churches who lose their focus, and these doors will shut. And let me say this. It isn't about having doors open. It isn't about having a great gathering of people. It is about speaking Jesus. And if this church isn't going to do it, then God's going to raise somebody up that will. So Pastor Phil said it. I've said it. We're a partnership here. And by the way, you know who needs this, this, who needs this message just as much as anybody? Me. I preach this message a lot of times. And I want God to use me to be salt. I want God use, to use me to be light. But here's the thing. God wants to use every one of you. You have value because God put value upon you. And there is a work to be done. To that end, we've been practicing this now in this assembly for 20 years. I do not know what God has for us in the future. I do know this. I will not always be the pastor here. There will be some day where God calls me home. And you may not always be here. But in the time that we have, may we band together with purpose. And let's do something for the glory of God.